It's the incredible G.I. Joe Mobile Command Center and it's hunting for Cobra. Concerned parents, corporate greed, and the brainwashing of a generation of children may sound like a rejected pitch for an episode of Batman the Animated Series, but we actually dealt with all of that in our reality. Once upon a time, humanity was battling a foe known the world over as a societal menace and a destroyer of young minds that needed to be stopped for good. That foe's name was Saturday Morning Cartoons, and no cartoon was more powerful than G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe is the code name for America's daring, highly trained special mission force. If you're a child of the 80s or 90s, then you probably have a very specific memory of sitting yourself down in front of the TV in the early hours of a Saturday morning and watching the latest adventures of your favorite cartoon characters. But while those memories may seem pretty sweet and innocent on the surface, there's an oddly sinister history behind them that we're still feeling the effects of today. Hey! TV rocks your brain. In 1960, the first episode of The Flintstones aired on ABC. Created by the legendary William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, The Flintstones became the first critically and commercially successful animated television show. Right from the beginning, everyone's favorite modern Stone Age family was tied to advertisements. In this case, The Flintstones' first two seasons were sponsored by the most 1960s company ever, Winston Cigarettes. Winston tastes good, like a cigarette should. Without this retrospectively terrible sponsor and the rest of the show's advertisement revenue, it's likely that the Flintstones wouldn't have existed. But luckily for Hanna-Barbera, commercials on TV had already become commonplace in the 1960s, which just so happens to be the decade that the first ever commercial for Hasbro's fiercely patriotic line of G.I. Joe action figures emerged, 20 years before the iconic TV show would show its face. The commercials for these new toys would run between television shows like The Flintstones, further perpetuating the success of animated TV with their advertising dollars. Other companies, and Hanna-Barbera themselves, looked to The Flintstones' success as a sort of blueprint. Some sought to create their own unique shows, while others simply re-ran cartoons originally made for movie-going audiences in a primetime slot, and the most prime slot of all ended up being Saturday mornings. See, by the time the 1970s rolled around, children were suddenly a very important demographic of the TV viewing public. They were voracious content consumers, uncritical viewers, and most importantly, completely oblivious to the fact that they were being marketed to. Research said that a lot of children couldn't understand the difference between the TV show meant to entertain them and the commercial meant to sell them things, and they certainly didn't understand the concept of persuasive marketing. Obviously, a lot of the marketing aimed at children was for toys, including G.I. Joe's, but with more eyes comes more critique. Concerns were starting to rise about just how much advertising was too much advertising, particularly when it came to ones targeted at sleep-eyed children who were just trying to eat their Pink Panther flakes and watch Tom and Jerry reruns. Action for Children's Television, or ACT, pressured the Federal Communications Commission for change, and the FCC, in turn, pressured the National Association of Broadcasters, or NAB. After years of pushback, they did eventually outline some changes to their programming. Namely, they would be cutting down on how many commercials could run on Saturday morning cartoons and regulating the content of the remaining commercials. Suddenly, toy ads were under a lot more scrutiny than ever before. Lastly, the NAB would be putting more of an emphasis on educational shows rather than purely entertainment-based ones. But that last bit was more of a suggestion than an actual rule. Science rules. Edutainment shows would become the exception. Companies were really looking for creative ways to make themselves richer than all of the eccentric Scooby-Doo villains. And the first franchise to find an answer to their commercially restrictive woes was G.I. Joe. Through a legal loophole in the toy marketing guideline left over from the 70s, Marvel and Hasbro made history by airing one of the first ever TV advertisements for a comic book with G.I. Joe, number one, in 1982. Toy commercials were being restricted, but comics? Those didn't have any regulations. Hasbro would go one step further with their capitalistic genius by partnering with the 80s TV legend Ron Friedman in 1983. Together, they created 95 episodes of G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, and its popularity cannot be overstated. Kids adored G.I. Joe, and so did Hasbro, since it managed to find a way to advertise toys to children without actually putting any toys in commercials. Since the focus was on comics and the characters in those comics, they weren't 
technically marketing toys, but they still sold them, a lot of them. Other companies were quick to bank off G.I. Joe's success. So began a decade that produced some incredible animated television that still largely is relevant today. Shows like Transformers, Thundercats, Super Mario Bros, Super Show, She-Ra, and Super Friends all took advantage of the G.I. Joe model. But while their quality was disparate, these shows all had one thing in common. They were made to sell toys to children. Figures and vehicles each sold separately from LJF. Product placement and promotion was no longer bound by the borders of ad breaks. Now the TV shows themselves had become ads. Thanks to the innovation of G.I. Joe, commercials were unnecessary until sitting President Ronald Reagan and his new head of the SEC deregulated them. So TV shows became commercials for toys, ad breaks became commercials for toys, and toys essentially became commercials for TV shows. It was a never-ending cycle of toy propaganda. A lot of parents were obviously unhappy with this, and the main target of their ire became G.I. Joe. Early pressures from parents and the still active ACT did result in some pitiful attempts at placation. You probably remember when a show's main characters would lecture kids about the importance of hard work and putting reflectors on your bicycle in an out of place PSA. If you have to ride when it's getting dark, have the right equipment and wear bright clothes. G.I. Joe was the first to adopt the practice not out of an urge to do good, but out of necessity so they could continue their children's marketing campaigns. Your advice really hit home. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. The real goal was clear. Children's TV had been turned into a toy marketing industry. By the mid-80s, department store shelves were bursting with the latest My Little Pony playsets, Mario Bros video games, and, of course, G.I. Joe action figures. Toy companies were making record profits, and the kids were unquenchable. But ACT and other organizations continued to fight back against this growing trend well into the 80s making it increasingly difficult to turn a profit. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, stopped airing new episodes in 1986, and Hasbro scaled their toy production back after a lackluster year of sales in 1989. President H.W. Bush signed the Children's Television Act into law in 1990. The CTA, or the Kid Vid Rules, ordered the FCC to take action against these exploitative shows and commercials, and put resources into the creation of more educational kids' content. G.I. Joe had long since disappeared from Saturday mornings, but the culture of toy marketing it created took years to reverse. Other 80s icons had mostly gone extinct or were struggling to stay afloat in the new political climate, and new shows were being created that surpassed them in popularity. Like all children's television that came before it, these shows were not born purely out of a desire to educate or entertain children. They of course made money off of merchandise and advertising, but with the FCC's more strict rules in place, the days of blatant brainwashing were over. And in a way, the entertainment and toy industries have never recovered. The adventure of G.I. Joe, Cobra Mamba, and other vehicles and figures sold separately. Go, go. For the most part, all of the companies and brands that created children's television programs in the 80s are still around today, producing TV shows, making toys, and banking on the nostalgia of the adults that grew up watching the programs designed specifically for the purpose of making as much money as possible. With the rise of streaming, children are no longer expected to sit down at 8 a.m. on a Saturday and consume a block of programs and advertisements. While we grew up loving cartoons, we couldn't know in the moment just how powerful their messaging was on our young minds. If only G.I. Joe had taught us about the dangers of television marketing and how it brainwashed a generation of kids. Oh well, now we know. And knowing is half the battle. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like more content like this, make sure you like the video and subscribe to Nerdstalgic.